Hello, this is my second video on Wilhelm Wundt. Whilst Wundt's position as the primary founder of academic psychology is well established, his name is now largely forgotten except by scholars. There are many people outside of psychology who can easily identify people like Freud and Pavlov, or even Piaget and Maslow, but even many psychology undergrads may have little idea who Wundt was. Why is this? Partly it reflects the difficulty of much of what he wrote. Wundt is credited with being an excellent lecturer, but his writings are described as heavy and hard to understand. They are also massive and daunting. More significantly, Wundt revised some elements in his work extensively and added much new material in the successive editions of his works so that some readers, at least, have found it hard to fathom what he intended. As per William James's famous dismissive quip, that Wundt's work was like a worm. You could cut it up with criticism, but each segment carried on wiggling. But even people who are familiar with his work and sympathetic to it cannot agree on what his main ideas were, so the different summaries of his work seem to be of different people. Most importantly, perhaps, later generations of psychologists just lost interest in the narrow research program that Wundt eventually set himself and his followers. Having established some basic principles, Wundtian psychology seemed to have nothing more to say, and psychologists moved on to examine new and more interesting questions. Wundt had proposed what was effectively his manifesto for experimental psychology, in his 1862 work, Contributions to the Theory of Sense Perception. This held that as soon as the psyche is viewed as a natural phenomenon and psychology as a natural science, the experimental methods must also be capable of full application to this science. Such research would follow Francis Bacon's method of changing the conditions in which phenomena occur in order to see the consequential changes. Wundt anticipated that whilst experimentation had as yet hardly begun in psychology, it would soon come to be applied far beyond sensation and perception. When it came to realising this manifesto, however, Wundt chose to restrict the scope of his studies very closely. Determined to be rigorously scientific in all his experimental work, Wundt focused on those aspects of psychology which could be strictly controlled under experimental conditions. One of the most important of these was reaction times, how long it took for an individual to respond to stimuli, a topic already usefully explored by Helmholtz and Donders, and now exhaustively examined by Wundt and his students, with even more rigorous concern with timing. A second aspect was a very close and precise monitoring of one's feelings and perceptions of events, such as during a reaction time experiment, a procedure Wundt termed introspection. A third topic was the difference between unconscious perception and what Wundt called ordinary apperception, for example, examining the process by which a subject was shown groups of letters or words very briefly without time to recognize them, but was still able to recall some of what had been seen. He also timed the amount of time it took to make word associations. To modern eyes, and to an increasing number of his contemporaries, Wundt's experiments came to seem trivial. Contrary to his earlier optimism that all aspects of the psyche could be explored experimentally, he had come to believe that higher mental processes were too variable to be examined objectively. Therefore, there were no experimental studies of learning, concept formation, thinking, language skills, the emotions, or interpersonal relations. Instead, such topics could only be discussed as part of the new field of what Wundt called cultural psychology, a subdiscipline which he developed. It was only possible to examine language and other higher order functions at the level of general trends amongst groups of people. He wrote about these at length, but only at the level of description, denying that rigorous experimentalism could be developed in these fields. 
This change in his thinking corresponded to a major reconceptualization of the scientific status of higher mental processes. Initially, he had seen the whole of psychology as natural science, Naturwissenschaft, but later he came to distinguish between immediate experience and higher mental activity. Only the experimental study of immediate experience was natural science. The rest of psychology was Geitzweissenschaft, science of the spirit, which was not amenable to experimental study. This insistence on excluding the study of higher mental powers from experimental psychology was combined with an authoritarian streak in Wundt's personality, a characteristic that was very common and even expected of high-ranking German professors in the 19th century. Thus, whilst Wundt was genial with his senior students and assistants, for example, inviting them for dinner on Sundays, he was also formal and could be dogmatic and pedantic. He lectured as an eminence to whom students were expected to defer. Thus, at the start of each academic year, he would line up his graduate students in a row and tell each of them what research they had to do in that year. No one dared to question these assignments. He also supervised the writing of his students' reports for publication, cutting out anything that didn't support his doctrines. His English follower, Edward Titchener, described him as humorless, indefatigable, and aggressive. This approach led him to prescribe many areas of psychology that today are accepted as essential. The excluded areas included practical applications of psychology, so that, for example, when one of his gifted students took up educational psychology, Wundt regarded it as an act of personal betrayal. Any form of introspection other than his own, for example, that promoted by the Wurzburg School, which we will consider in the next video, the beginnings of child psychology, which was rejected as not being real psychology because the conditions of study could not be adequately controlled, animal psychology, which could not be studied at his laboratory because no introspection was possible, French works on hypnotism and suggestion, lacking introspection, it could not be real psychology, and he was particularly scornful of William James, seeing his work as beautiful literature, but not psychology. In assessing Wundt's work, we can see that whilst he failed to get psychology accepted as an essential part of philosophy, as he'd hoped, he did secure its intellectual independence as a new academic discipline. Through enormous hard work and determination, he placed academic psychology on a secure footing in Germany, as well as exerting a distant but decisive influence on the growth of American psychology. In their quest to make their studies scientific, most of the physiologists had rejected consciousness as subjective and unobservable. They had abandoned altogether the ancient concerns of philosophical psychology, Wundt accepted the methods of the physiologists, but placed them in a different philosophical context. In so doing, he ensured that conscious mental processes were restored as an integral part of the psychology project. But in practice, Wundt's definition of acceptable research was so narrow that some of the most able younger German psychologists rebelled against his system and initiated their own separate schools of psychology, the subject of the next video. The scientific status of psychology remained a problem for many American psychologists. In the United States, Wundtian psychology was challenged from the outset by the ideas and approach of William James, but James was not interested in developing a systematic school of his own thinking that psychology was still too young a discipline to attain a fully scientific status. Far more determined were the behaviorists, led by John Watson, who for a time came to dominate American psychology, and who chose to utterly reject introspection and the idea of mental processes in order to make psychology conform to their idea of science. Both James and the behaviorists are dealt with in future lectures. Thank you.